under attack. Record number of killings. 75 In the 1990s, on the streets of America's cities, gun violence had reached an all-time high. The now the second leading cause of death among As the death toll mounted, some officials around the country sought a new approach to try to control guns. Neighborhoods are desperate to be delivered from violence. Relying upon legislative action at the national level or the state level seemed like a, a blind uh, you know, and, and futile endeavor. New York Attorney General Elliot Spitzer and other officials wanted to hold gun manufacturers liable in court for weapons that ended up in the hands of criminals. Forget Congress. The NRA's got Congress. You bought and sold like a sack of potatoes. But you can get the attention of the courts. Taking gun makers to court drew the attention of some heavy hitters, many of the same lawyers that had just beaten the tobacco companies. They said, we'll analogize the handgun to the cigarette, and we'll get a big settlement with a lot of money, and we'll get the gun industry to agree to all kinds of compromises and so forth. The Clinton White House liked the idea, too. Together, they all aimed directly at the nation's largest gun maker, Smith & Wesson. And Smith & Wesson is an iconic company. It's one of the oldest, largest gun companies in America. The Smith & Wesson name kind of just leaps out at you from every Western. They had produced more than 6 million Model 10s, the 38 caliber military and police revolver. Smith & Wesson was a very respected company, a very a major player in the gun market. Ed Schultz was the CEO, neither a gun lover nor particularly political. But Smith & Wesson was facing millions of dollars in legal fees from the lawsuits. I believe we needed to eliminate these lawsuits. Uh, uh, my concern was to get this behind us so we could move forward. He agreed to a series of negotiations, some held at night in secret locations around the nation's capital. He's doing this in secret because the NRA has made absolutely no secret of its opposition to any conciliation toward the Clintons. Uh, the NRA would much prefer to fight to the death on this issue than, than ever compromise. But by the spring of 2000, the White House and Smith & Wesson had the firm outlines of a deal. Safety locks, limiting the size of magazines, and expanded background checks. When, uh, on a very confidential basis, I was shown a, the draft agreement, um, I, I was actually elated at how far Smith & Wesson had been willing to go. Less than a year after the shooting at Columbine High School, President Clinton announced the agreement. Good afternoon. Today, I am pleased to report that a key member of the industry has decided to set a powerful example of responsibility. Here was a major player in the industry saying, yes, actually, there is something that we can do. Uh, so it was undercutting sort of everything the industry and the NRA had been saying to that point. Very, very threatening. The NRA's leader, Wayne LaPierre, saw the deal as a threat to the organization's dominance. The NRA found that totally unacceptable, and they were furious. And so the, the NRA determined that, the, that Smith & Wesson was now an, an enemy, essentially, and decided to go after them with, and try and punish them much the way they try and punish politicians. They quickly issued bulletins. It would appear this particular gunmaker is willing to sacrifice the rights of gun owners. Press releases. This is a futile act of craven self-interest jeopardizing an entire U.S. industry and undermining a constitutionally guaranteed right. And published magazine articles blasting the deal. When it did become known that Smith & Wesson was willing to compromise, a boycott materialized overnight. The retailers calling their wholesalers and saying, cancel my Smith & Wesson orders. Wholesalers calling Smith & Wesson and going, 5,000 guns on order, cancel it. The result was that Smith & Wesson was isolated, they were vilified, um, uh, their sales plummeted, um, and they, they almost went bankrupt. Smith & Wesson was once worth over $112 million. It was sold at a purchase price of $15 million. 
the, the message that was sent to the other gun manufacturers is that if you don't want to go through a, a real difficult time, stay away from this forever. And I would suspect that in the future, the gun manufacturers won't deal with it at all. They'll just let the NRA handle it. It was a crucial victory for Wayne LaPierre. Going forward, he would have the total support of the gun manufacturers. In a very tangible way, the NRA became much more successful in raising money. The gun manufacturers and uh, wholesalers and retailers began writing much bigger checks to the NRA, so the relationship really was uh, you know, consummated in the, in the traditional American fashion with, with good old cash. <laughs> 